name's Jen Keeler. I'm the Director of Operations here at Exeter BFC, and I just wanted to talk to you about a couple things going on. Number one is we are needing some volunteers in several different ministries of the church. Uh, we always need help in children's ministry. Specifically right now, we could use some more helpers in the nursery, as well as some teachers and volunteers for the kiddos downstairs in their classes. For that, you can see Becky Demko. We also need some help in our food pantry. We have been having more and more families come and visit us for this food pantry each time we hold one. So that means we need more volunteers. So if you are willing to come out and help with that, really you can help in any area, but specifically we need help directing traffic and just some people to walk around and talk to the people in their cars as they wait for their food. So for that, you could talk to Bruce or Pam Kell. And finally, we are in need of some more greeters to help greet people on a Sunday morning. So if you're kind of a friendly person and you don't mind greeting people as they enter the church, you can see Yvonne Schallenberg and let her know you'd like to help out in that area. You can see this week's e-bulletin for all those people's contact information and to volunteer for any of those ministries. On Friday, September 30th at 6.30 p.m., we'll be having a bluegrass bonfire. So if that's your thing and you enjoy bluegrass, come on out for that. We'll have s'mores and a bonfire and bluegrass. But make sure you bring your own chair. Look forward to seeing you then. Just wanted to give you a little bit of an update on our capital campaign. I had announced a few weeks ago that the total amount we are trying to raise is $61,429. As of September 4th, we have raised $16,777. So thanks to everyone that's given to that so far. Obviously, we're gonna continue to accept donations towards that um, till we can reach our goal. And you can see this week's e-bulletin on how to do that. But basically, you can give online through our website. You can give today via an offering envelope, just mark Capital Campaign. Or you can mail it in or drop it off to the church office. Again, any checks that are written should just be notated as Capital Campaign. Next, we're going to see a video about our men's prayer breakfast coming up, and as well as our adult Sunday school classes, which will be starting in October. It's the fourth Saturday of the month this weekend, which means it's time for our monthly men's breakfast, which means it's an opportunity for any and all men, whether from EBFC or otherwise, to gather together, enjoy some delicious breakfast food, as well as some spiritual nourishment from a different speaker every single month. This month's speaker is Pastor Doug Plouffe. And any of you men, if you're interested, there's no need to sign up or anything. We would just love to see you attending Saturday morning here at the EBFC cafeteria at 8 a.m. Hope to see you there. This one is a little bit of a last-minute announcement, but on October 1st, we're going to be having a church-wide yard sale here in the back parking lot. It's going to go from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., just those four hours that morning, and we'd love for anybody and everybody to come and participate. If you've got some stuff that you'd like to get rid of, maybe you can make a few dollars in the process. We uh, will be able to provide you a table if you don't have one, but we absolutely would love to know if you plan on being here. So if you'd like to get yourself registered or signed up, it's free, but you can call the church or you can sign up online with the link that is in our e-bulletin. One other thing is maybe you have some stuff, but you're not going to be able to participate that day. You can actually donate your specific items to the Exeter BFC table, and anything that we sell is going to go directly back to the church. So if you're interested, make sure to get yourself signed up because that's coming in two weeks. It is a rain or shine event as well, and if it happens to rain on that day, we'll end up just moving everything into the gymnasium. Good morning, church. This is David Evans. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to a new Sunday school class we're starting here at Exeter Bible Fellowship. Uh, Sean McNulty, David Rhodes, and myself will be leading a study through the book of Revelation. Uh, There's never been a more controversial book. Uh, There are several different views that you can come at it from. But one thing I know that reigns supreme through any view that I've seen so far is that God is in control. In these times that we live in, uh, which are kind of crazy right now, uh, we can understand that God is in control of all of it. And I take great comfort in that. Uh, we're uh, We're going to start this class in October the 9th. Uh, We're going to run it from 9 a.m. to 9.45 to get you out in time for church. And uh, as an added note, there will be no child care for this. If you're interested in the class and you want to sign up for it, we have three ways to do that. One is in the e-bulletin. Two is on the community bulletin board. And the third way is uh, at the um, welcome desk downstairs. I hope you consider signing up for the class. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you there. Uh, Have a great Lord's Day, and we'll see you soon. 
So that's all the announcements we have for this morning. We do want to welcome everybody, and especially if you're new or visiting with us for the first time today, a special welcome to you. We would invite you to take the card out of the pocket of the chair in front of you, and you will see two different QR codes on it. One QR code, if you scan it, it will take you to our website where you can fill out our online visitor connection form. We'd love to know you are here today and have a record of your visit. And we would also invite you to stop down at our Welcome Center in the main lobby today after the service and pick up a special gift bag we've made just for you. And whether you're new or you're regular here, we always invite you to check out our e-bulletin. It's the best way to stay connected and know about everything that's going on here. And you can do that at www.exeterbfc.org backslash bulletin. Or you can scan the other QR code on the card in front of you. That will take you directly to our e-bulletin. Before we continue in worship, we'll invite you to stand and greet your neighbor. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're ready to worship with us. This is a song that we, we had done probably about a year ago, but then we reintroduced it just a few weeks. Um, and I'd love for us to open with this, just to be reminded of that Jesus Christ, he is our hope. He's in, in life and death. He's the one that we can look to um, for answers, for, for hope, for peace, and all of those things. So as we begin with worship this morning, let's keep that on our hearts and our minds as we worship him. Confess. 
Christ, our hope in life and death. Let's declare this. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives. Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. Then we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy. When Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah. to worship you. So I just ask that you, um, God, you take away all the other distractions, clean our hearts, and God, focus our minds so that we can worship and honor the King of Kings who has done so much for each and every one of us. God, you be glorified today above all else. And Jesus' holy name above all names, we pray.
complete. He reigns in victory. Oh, sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. Come on, sing it out. Sing hallelujah to the King. Worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is held. Last time I praise, I praise God for what He's done. You may be seated. As the men come forward, please join me in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather together serve you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you for the fellowship that we get to enjoy with other believers. And Lord, we just lift up those who are unable to join us today due to health issues or sickness. Uh, just think of Paul Weber, uh, Charlie Moyer, uh, Sid Heppentrager. As they recover from sickness, Lord, we pray for them. Pray for their perseverance. Pray for their strength, their healing. Uh, we just pray for for their recovery, and uh, just give them strength, and we thank you for them. Pray for Pastor Bill as he prepares to give your word. Pray for his wisdom and guidance as he speaks your truth. And once again, Lord, you tell us in Hebrews 4 that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So please, Lord, let the truth of your word penetrate our hearts. Let it strengthen, encourage, correct, and discipline us. And let us apply what we are taught today for your glory. And I do thank you for this offering we are about to receive. Uh, let's continue, Lord, to let us use it wisely. Let us be good stewards. Thank you, Lord, for for blessing us, Lord, that we're able to give back to you and, and the work here and the work in missions and the work across the world with your gospel. We thank you for all these things and give you the glory for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. As those containers are being passed, we invite you to stand once again, if you're able, and sing with us. Oceans rise 
We like our comfort zones. We like staying where we are. And the things that we know. But God, you called us to be more. To be your children. To be a light in this dark. step out into the unknown and to trust you. So God, as we sing this, renew our hearts. Renew us. Help us to trust you. where we have unbelief, help our unbelief. May we not be silent. May we love the way you want us to. Not the way the world calls us to, but God, your love.
is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of continue together in I Surrender All.
Good morning. <clears throat> you know, just to touch on the announcements again real quick. Um, I mean, if I wasn't up here, I'd love volunteering with kids. I don't like leading children's ministry. I did that as a family pastor once, and I realized quickly that was not my calling. It was draining. But I do enjoy teaching Sunday school. So, again, if you're, I mean, if you're uh, willing to teach what the church believes in, and you enjoy hanging out with kids, please contact Becky. It's, a, it's just a great opportunity to serve the Lord. Again, we present serving opportunities. They're opportunities. Um, we don't want to force anybody to do anything, but this is an opportunity to use what God's gifted you in to serve the Lord. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to having a Revelation Sunday School. Uh, I would love to go to the class myself, but filling my head with that and then coming up to preach probably wouldn't work. Uh, but we will provide a translator for David Evans and his southern accent. We'll get somebody in between. I can maybe get my wife to go there as a translator or something. But uh, we're looking forward to that and uh, grateful that the Lord allows us more opportunities to dive into his word. Um, that's what we're here to do this morning is to worship the Lord and receive instruction through his word. So let's get into it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the honor and the responsibility of standing up here and presenting your word. Oh, Lord, may I get out of the way. And again, I pray that what is presented here today is your truth and not mine. Lord, I pray anything of me is immediately forgotten. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promise to not uh, have it return void. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're in Philippians chapter 1. Again, last week we went 1, one through 6. Uh, gave kind of an introduction and a background to what's going on in Philippians and really focused heavily on Philippians 1.6. And uh, Lord willing, you grasp the concept and we, we, we prove through Scripture that once you are His, you are His indeed. And um, the way that that is spoken of again and again and again throughout Scripture as an encouragement to us. So we're going to continue here in verse 7 through 11. Again, there's, there's not that many verses, but we have plenty, plenty to speak about. So I'm going to read from verse 7 through to verse 11. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So I want to start in verse 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Again, at the beginning, he was saying how grateful he is for that congregation and the joy he has had serving with them um, and appreciative of their gift in sending things to him while he is in prison. And right here, he is, again, reminding them of how he loves them, he cares for them. Why? because they are partakers of grace with him. I think that's a significant statement there, because when I was younger, uh, we moved a lot, like a lot, a lot. And me and my brothers realized one of the best ways to make new friends when we moved, it's very different these days, but back then was we would grab our baseball gloves, our, our baseball bats, and we'd go out to the field. 
and we'd play, depending on where you live, we'd play things like, uh, it was called hot box or um, uh, pickle, running bases. I don't know what it was called in, in Pennsylvania, but, you know, you got the two bases, and you run back and forth, and you can peg kids, and it was great fun for young boys. So we would always do that, and, and we would find that almost within a week, we had a full baseball team on both sides, and we knew just about every kid for like a half a mile radius because we found something that we all enjoyed together, sports. We enjoyed baseball. We enjoyed going outdoors and playing and doing things like that. And uh, as I've gotten older, I think it's a little more difficult to find unity in, in different things, but it is amazing even today how adults from... Uh, from nowhere will find that they can agree over football teams. Like they'll meet a stranger with the same football jersey and all of a sudden they'll be friends over football jerseys. Well, Paul's saying here, why, why are we united? Why are we the same? Because we're partakers of grace. And I think that we have to continually be reminded of that, that we are one through Christ. We are unified, not because we all agree on certain things here at BFC because we all have the same politics, because we all enjoy the same music, or it shouldn't be because this is just the closest walk from your house or whatever the reason may be. I would like to think that we gather together and worship together because we all are partakers of grace, the same grace through the same Christ, that that's why we're unified. That's why we're excited to show up to church. I know that statistically speaking, Right now, over the last three years, almost every church across the board in North America, at least the average, is that attendance is down a little over 30%. People have found reasons not to come to church, and then it became a habit. I think, honestly, there's still quite a few people that in their mind are telling themselves they're still active participants in church, even though they haven't been for years. Because isn't it funny how our brains do that? That we, we're like, you know, I was just there a little bit ago and you don't realize it's actually been years since you've attended, yet we've got y'all sitting here right now, you've been returning to church, you've been deciding, yes, this is important in my life. I believe that this is what God has called us to do, to assemble. And I would like to think that we show up on a Sunday morning actually excited because we're all partakers of grace. We have done nothing to earn that grace. There's nobody in here that's greater than somebody else. We're all partakers of grace. Even in high school or sports teams, it's like everybody wants to be friends with the kid who's better than everybody else at something. Like everybody wants to be friends with the, the captain of the team, right? But here it's not really the way that it works. I would like to think that we all love each other for the same reason that Paul loved these individuals because we're partakers of grace. And when we find it easy to fight with each other and focus on our differences, I hope that we can get back to the fact that we're all partakers of grace. Paul writes in Galatians 3, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, there's qualifiers there. We're not all sons of God for no reason. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed, clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Again, I've heard this set of verses abused, but ultimately what Paul is writing here in Philippians and Galatians is we are one through Christ. We, we shouldn't look at the reasons that we differ in our normal day-to-day -day life, but that we are one through Christ. Again, I have found in my life as a Christian, I have gotten... The Lord has allowed me to live a, a unique life, I think. Again, I've described it kind of as an Indiana Jones type life. But throughout the globe, if I meet somebody that's a Christian, we're instantly friends. If you find somebody who's a genuine believer, it's amazing how quick those friendships develop and continue throughout the years. I mean, there's an individual that set us up to go to Africa. The first time I ever met him, his name was Ryan Bess, was in Africa, and he's still a good friend of mine today. Why? because we are both partakers of grace. And I pray that that's what we focus on. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit further in this section of our differences, what's important and what's not. There are differences that we should really focus on, but we need prayer for wisdom in what those are. So Paul continually says he has affection towards these people. What, what kind of affection? 
Verse eight, for God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now we're gonna dive deep into this in Philippians two as to exactly what that means from Christ's perspective, a self-sacrificial God-honoring love of viewing others as more important than yourself. Again, we're gonna look really deep into that in Philippians 2. But for today, I wanna focus on the fact that Paul says that he wants to love them with the affection of Christ Jesus. That word affection is a Greek word used in one other spot in the Bible, and, and I would like you to turn there real quick. It's in Luke. For those that were in our How to Study Your Bible class, we spent a lot of time here. It's a famous set of verses. It's in Luke 10, if you wanna turn there. It's the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, many of your Bibles, if they have subheadings, start this story in verse 30, but it's not where that story starts. The parable actually starts verse 25. So Jesus had been talking. He tells his disciples something specific. Then it goes on in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? So again, this is not my overall thrust right now is to explain why the parable, but I, I think it's important to emphasize the fact that the reason this parable is being told is because somebody asked, how do I inherit eternal life? How may I be saved is the question. And Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan is the response. So the thrust, the agenda, if you will, of the parable is not be a nice person to everybody. It is how can I be saved? And Jesus gives that parable as a response as to how you can be saved. Moving on in verse 26. He said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Again, Jesus is saying, yeah, you, you wanna be saved? Love the Lord perfectly. If you can do that, you're go, you'll be all right. But wishing to justify himself, again, to be declared righteous before God, he's trying to justify himself, saying, yeah, I do that. That's me. Wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus is giving this response, showing to him that it's impossible to justify yourself because he makes a Samaritan the hero of the story. And a Jewish teacher of the law would say there's no way a Samaritan can be the hero, hero of the story. I'm supposed to live like a Samaritan? That's impossible. And Jesus is basically saying, exactly, it's impossible to save yourself. But look at this story as he, as he says the parable in verse 30. Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. That's the same Greek word that Paul had used for he hopes to have the affection of Christ Jesus. That same word, affection of Christ Jesus, is this word that the Samaritan had felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. So if you want to have the affection of Christ Jesus, if you want to treat people properly, even Jesus uses this parable of the Good Samaritan, you want to know how to love others, to have affection of Christ Jesus, treat other people the way that the Samaritan did. The Samaritan who's hated, treated, treated his enemy well, sacrificed, did all these things for that individual and made sure to take care of him. That's the kind of way that we should treat other people I think that the struggle that many of us have is we have nine defined goals of affection. Many of us go about our lives in our specific roles that we have thinking that we are properly affectionate towards others, but it's actually not the standard that Christ has set for us. So we treat our wives, our children, our neighbors, our coworkers 
certain ways, but oftentimes that standard is just because we think that's the best way it should be done. What complicates this is many of us have learned how to be fathers, husbands, workers, things like that from our parents or from movies or from books, especially these days, the less interaction adults have with children and children learn from the internet, they're learning how to live their lives from outside sources. And so without even knowing it, they're setting their standards of the way that I love somebody else affectionately, the way I show affection is through physical interaction, right? Especially young people. If I don't show physical interaction, I must not care for them because they're not being taught that that's not the proper way to interact with somebody of the opposite sex. And a lot of us have just kind of set these standards without thinking, what's the standard? And so we say, I'm, I'm a good husband. That's fine, perhaps you are, perhaps I am, but by whose standard? Is it by mine? Is it by the world's? Am I comparing myself to my dad, my father-in-law? Who am I comparing it to? Again, what adds even more complications to this is oftentimes we get confirmation through others or the world that we are being a good dad or we are being a good husband or a good wife or a good child, except we're way outside of what the Bible says we're supposed to be like. I've known individuals that were married that were both engaged in very, very destructive behavior, but here's what they told me in a counseling session. This was many years ago. They told me of this thing that they were doing that was totally inappropriate, but they both said, but we both really enjoy it. And so because they both enjoyed it, by default, both of them figured then it must be okay because we're both happy with it. Sometimes parents treat their children a certain way and say, you know what, it's not a big deal what you just did. And the kid's like, that's awesome. I love that. I'm not getting disciplined. I'm not having any consequences for my actions. So the kid comes up to you and says, you're the best mom ever. And you're like, I am the best mom ever, right? The kid confirms. Then, in fact, you're such a good parent that all the other kids want to hang out at your house. And what's really popular these days are parents are the kid's best friend. And they're like, man, your mom, your dad, they're so cool. Is is that the standard that we're going for? The problem is we oftentimes get confirmation, but that confirmation is not biblical. How does the Bible say you're supposed to be a spouse? How does the Bible say you're supposed to raise your children? The affection of Christ Jesus is the way that we are supposed to live, and it is incredibly, incredibly complex and difficult to have the affection of Jesus Christ towards other people. And again, too often, we look at everybody else and compare ourselves to everybody else and say, at least I'm loving my spouse a little bit better than my neighbor, or at least I'm not my boss who's cheating on his wife, et cetera. But our standard should be, do we have the affection of others that Jesus Christ has towards others? Self-sacrificing, God-honoring love. Do we live that kind of way? I would say it's actually impossible to live that way outside of God's help, outside of God doing it for us and through us. See, Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12 through 13. May the Lord cause you, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is very similar to the prayer we see here in Philippians 1.9. 1.9 says this, and this I pray. So what we're about to see is Paul's prayer for the people, which he said before this. I'm continually offering prayers for you. Now he tells them what he's praying specifically. This is really the heart of what we're gonna dive into here today. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. So let's just stop here for a minute. I wanna talk for a second about prayer. I think we get in the habit of prayer. Um, Y'all remember landlines? Maybe. Some of y'all really don't know what I'm talking about. So I may have used this analogy before, but 
when I was a kid, we always had to answer the phone, hello, this is the Burtons. That's how it started. Hello, this is the Burtons. And then wherever it went from there, it went from there. And I remember at, at night, we would always gather together as a family around the table, eat dinner, do devotions, all those things, right? And so it was my turn to pray. And as soon as I bowed my head, how do you think I started the prayer? Hello, this is the Burtons. That's how I started. Why did I start it that way? Because prayer had become a mindless, insignificant thing in my life. It was just a, okay, it's my turn to pray. I probably repeat the same prayer the same way that I mindlessly answer the phone and say, hello, this is the Burtons. I think that's often how we approach prayer. Now, for instance, how many people go on trips and pray, Lord, I pray that we would arrive there safe. I'm not saying this is a bad prayer. I'm saying when we pray this, are we really laying these things before the king of the universe? Or are we bringing to him, honestly, natural things that kind of work themselves out? Lord, I really pray that my lawn's gonna grow again. Your lawn's gonna grow. It's what lawn does. Lord, I pray that my kid gets over to sniffles. Again, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but colds happen, colds come and go. Do you know why we often pray, God, please allow us to arrive safe, arrive safe, but we don't arrive safely and then get on our knees and thank God for arriving safely? Is because it's kind of the natural course of things. You drive somewhere, you get there, and you're like, yes, I drove safely, I arrived safely. Do you actually say, wow, the king of the universe is the one who got me there? And you may sometimes, but I think, again, oftentimes we pray at the beginning, God help me to get there, but probably only 50% of the time, if we're generous, do we finish the trip and say, God, thank you for letting us get here. Because we're not actually interacting with the king of the universe. We're just like, I'm used to praying this kind of thing. But if we really believe that we're going before the king of the universe, that we've been granted access through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I mean, truly, again, I'm talking to myself here too. Are these the kind of prayers that we would really be praying? I'm not saying they're bad. But I think we would be shooting for some more significant things that only the king of the universe does. And that's what Paul prays for here for people because who could help others abound in love other than the king of the universe? Who could help us to love others properly the way that Christ loves people? Who could help us abound more and more in that type of love in knowledge and all discernment? See, that's the real struggle. Not just loving other people, but loving other people in knowledge and discernment. And what does that mean? First, we have to start with this, this huge challenge. Number one, what is love? Come on, somebody, baby, don't hurt me. Don't. Nobody's gonna respond with, everywhere you go, you say, what is love? Somebody starts to sing the song back. What is love? It is the most commonly used word and something I hear in pretty much every counseling session I've ever had in my entire life. We use the word love, but we don't define it. Again, we don't have an actual standard for it. And so it's, what kind of love? Well, I love my husband. I love my wife. What does that mean? Typically, it means I like when they make me feel good. And when they don't make me feel good, I no longer love them. In fact, I'll look for somebody else to be married to. Is that love? Well, I love my kids. Okay, what does love mean to you? And people say, all right, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Yes, 1 Corinthians 13, I agree. It says love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. The interesting thing about that section in love is there's eight positives and there's eight negatives, and every one of them is our verbs. That is how you put love into action, is precisely that verse there in 1 Corinthians 13. How do you put love into action? How do you properly love others in what you should do and shouldn't do? That helps us in how we should act. Now we need knowledge and discernment as to when to apply that, how to apply that. 
That would, that's what is exceptionally difficult. But before we dive into that, let me continue on the definition of love. Here's my personal definition of love, and I believe that it is throughout the entire Bible described this way. And I always use this, and I do believe it's biblical, though there's not a verse that says this. Again, 1 Corinthians 13 tells you how to act in love. It's all action words. They're all verbs. But I believe the Bible says this is proper love. Love is doing whatever you can to put someone else in the center of God's will. Again, I believe biblical love is doing whatever you can to put somebody else in the center of God's will. The hard part is knowing what God's will is and knowing where somebody else stands in relation to God's will. That's where we need knowledge and discernment. So I want to really dive into how do we get the knowledge and discernment of that? Well, one, of course, you have to get into the Bible. How can you know how to properly love others and love the Lord without knowing the way that the Bible describes God and us? I can think I'm loving God properly, but if I don't get into God's word and find out how he desires to be loved and served and worshiped, then I'm just doing it my own way. And so knowledge comes from understanding God's word. It comes from truth. It comes into diving into his word and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you through his word. It's hard. It takes a lot of work. Discernment is how do you apply that properly? And this is where it gets really, really hard. And while Paul is like, I go to the king of the universe and I pray consistently that you would abound in love and knowledge and discernment because only God can teach us how to do this. See, 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says this, and we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. I like to tell you, I believe that just about every human being falls into every one of these categories, and each one of us struggles in different ones. Because I'll tell you, this is how I tend to treat people, okay? This is my default. This is Bill Burton's default. This is how I would have written 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And I urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, admonish the faint-hearted, admonish the weak, admonish all men. Right? Some of y'all are like this. Encourage the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, encourage the weak, encourage all men. See, it takes true discernment and knowledge and understanding as to what situation you're in See, if I go to my children, I was talking to John about this this morning, when my kids, and I, I see this every week, especially this week, right, while I'm studying it and praying about this, did the prayer suddenly change me? Yes, but also made me more aware of my life and how I need God to change the way that I interact with other people. So my children in the morning, how do you think kids feel about getting up early and going to school? Pretty much never like it. It's just about a fight every morning. Sometimes it's just one of those annoying parent-child fights, but sometimes, genuinely, my kids are just homesick or they just, maybe they got picked on the day before. Like, there's genuine, like, heartache there of, I don't want to leave the safety and comfort of my home and go somewhere else. How do you think I handle that? What does the Bible say? Encourage the faint-hearted. What's dad's response? Listen, this is life. This is as easy as it gets. In 10 years, the same thing's going to happen, except you have to get up and go to work. And guess what? Nobody there is going to like you either. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> Here's the thing. We laugh, right? But like, now be a seven-year-old who's genuinely going to their dad with a hurt heart and get that response. I'm not loving him properly. And I need God to work on my heart. And if I don't pray for him to teach me how to love more and more with knowledge and discernment, then I'm just going to do it my way. And you know what my wife, how she handles these things? Hey, mom, there's a car driving by. I just threw a rock through the window because I just felt like it. Well, honey, you do have a strong arm. I'm impressed that you hit a car, a moving car with an object. Good job. You should play baseball. Right? Like, right? Like, that's just, she encourages, like, everybody. Like, no matter what, it's like, yay, good job. And I'm like, no, not good job. We've got to discipline that, right? There's the right time 
to behave a certain way and to treat people a certain way. But we have to know God's word. We have to have discernment, and we need to know what proper love is because if love is doing whatever you can to put somebody in the center of God's will, then you're not acceptant of their sins. How you encourage them about their recognition of sin is very different. Where do they fall even in this verse? Are they being unruly? I certainly have people that come to my office that are very unruly, and they need to be admonished. There are people that come that are just brokenhearted and they need to be encouraged. And here's the problem, right? If you're one of the encourage everybody people or the admonish everybody, help the weak. Does it help to encourage the weak? Somebody comes to you, they genuinely are in a situation of weakness. They need help and we say, I will pray for you. Yeah, you're patting them on the back, but they need help. The Samaritan could have gone up and said, I'll pray for you. See ya maybe even stopped and prayed at that moment and then kept going. Is that what he did? No, he helped the weak. He stepped in the gap. He did something. But I think a lot of us just default to our de facto way we were made and all of us tend towards a propensity of a certain type of sin. We all are just have that in us. I'm not the best encourager, but if you, if you need somebody to push you, I'll be there, right? That's, we're just all a little bit different in that way But what we need to be is like Christ, perfect in all of those, knowing exactly when and how to encourage each other. But the Bible is full of these types of situations. Romans 9, or Romans uh, Romans 12, starting at verse 9. Listen to this. Let love be without hypocrisy. We're all very good at that too, right? I mean, I'm a pastor. You know how hard it is to not be a hypocrite? to ask people to live out things that I myself struggle with on a day-to-day basis. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. How are we with that? Not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. How are we doing with that one? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Who can love this way? Who can discern their situation well enough to know how to properly respond without, without God? Without diving into his word, without the power of the Holy Spirit, how can we possibly hope to respond to individuals this way? To feed your enemy, to give them a drink, to pray for your enemy instead of cursing them. To show up to church each week and say, I'm here to lift the Lord up and to lift others up. To see everyone else as more important than myself. How can we do that? unless the king of the universe guides us in that. And that's why Paul is saying, I pray so fervently for you to do this, that you would love people this way. Why? Verse 10, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus. So again, why abound in love and knowledge and discernment? So that, and you know, it's great when the Bible does that, so that he's telling you why. So you can approve the things that are excellent. So you may live and love sincerely and genuinely. But what does that mean? So here's what the actual word approve means. It means to to judge to be genuine or specifically to distinguish between things that differ. It's very interesting. Approve means to distinguish between things that differ. What things? Things that are excellent. What does the word excellent mean? 
It's a comparative word, and it means discerning, uh, determining between best and necessary. So there's two comparative words here, and he's saying, so that you will be able to approve the things that are excellent. So you will be able to discern those things that are best. So you will be able to focus your life on the things that matter the most. And you don't get caught up in all the weeds. You don't get caught up in all the little things. And boy, do we need Jesus for that. Again, that same Greek word is used in Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow. The same word excellent is, is the word here. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? Are you not worth much more than they is the same Greek word as excellent. And what is he saying? Comparatively speaking, are not humans of much greater value than the sparrow? It's not devaluing the sparrow, but it's increasing the value of humans. So there's a more significant portion there. Men are more important than sparrows. Same as the concept in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost command. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So Paul, again, is saying, I am praying that you abound in love, knowledge, and discernment so that... When you love people, you draw them towards Christ and you do whatever you can to make sure that they hear, well done, good and faithful slave. He is saying, I am praying for you to love people properly and discern how to do that and not get caught up in the little insignificant fights that we tend to get caught up in. More importantly, he's saying, don't get caught up in works-based salvation. I would love to dive into Romans 14, but let me give you a synopsis here of Romans 14. Essentially in Romans 14, you know what? We got time. I'm going there. Let's do it. Flip. Flip to the left to Romans 14. We're just going to read a small section of it. Again, I'm just saying after, um, you know, about 10 years of being a pastor and um, having grown up in a, a, um, a pastoral home and going to churches all across America, Christians tend to fight with each other. We tend not to abound in love. We, we tend to fight a wee bit amongst ourselves. And Paul is saying, are you, are you really fighting over the things that are significant? Because there are fights worth having. There are fights worth having, but we tend to fight over preferences. We tend to fight over non-significant things. Again, you should read the whole chapter, but I'm just going to read a couple verses, right? Verse, verse 1 in chapter 14 of Romans 14. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Isn't it interesting that the correlation is there is the one who restricts their diet is the one who's weak in faith. And throughout this also, he says, you, know, you want to know a weak Christian? A weak Christian is easily offended. A weak Christian is easily offended. They see things like, dude, you're eating meat from idols. And Paul's like, who cares? Why are you caught up in this? He goes on further to say, some of you think you need to hold on to certain Sabbaths or certain, uh, certain festivals, for certain feasts. You have to worship a certain day and one day is more important than other days. He's like, why are you fighting over this? Be convinced in your own heart how you're supposed to live and go live it. Everybody has to give an account for their own life. Worry about the account you have to give because that's gonna be more than enough. Why are you so worried about the account they're gonna have to give? He's saying, why are you getting so caught up in this? Look, if we change that into today's day and age, did you hear so-and-so drinks beer? Can you believe it? Did you know that they have a tattoo? How about that, how about that person that shows up to church and they're not, man, do you see how they dressed? Like, they're wearing shorts to church. There must be something wrong with them. Why? Why? Why is that the stuff 
that we get so caught up in. Man, I'm leaving that church. They, they don't have enough fun stuff for my kids. They don't, they don't sing the songs that I like. Listen, I'm telling you, all throughout the Bible, it calls out that kind of behavior as petty and useless. Why are you fighting over those things that have nothing to do with salvation? Why? That's a works-based religion. Well, if I dress a certain way, I must be a better Christian. I'm wearing a suit, so I must be a better Christian than the rest of y'all that aren't today. That's the way that that path leads to thinking like that. If you have a conviction in your heart that you should or shouldn't do things, awesome. Do or don't do them. But the Bible says, outside the Bible, you cannot force that among other Christians. But also in the same chapter, he says, but you better be careful the way that you do live because you may be a stumbling block for somebody else. So guess what? Again, I'll say this publicly. I do not think that biblically speaking, there's anything wrong with drinking alcohol. I do not believe that that's in the Bible. 100% it's wrong to get drunk. 100% it's wrong to drink to get drunk. There's a lot of dangers with alcohol. Do I think that the Bible says it's a sin? No, I don't. In fact, the Old Testament specifically talks about it as a blessing and a way that you can worship the Lord. And so I think you have a real weak argument to say that the Bible says that it's sin. Can it be a sin? 100%. And guess what? If you go out and I'm counseling somebody who's an alcoholic and that guy shows up to a restaurant and I'm over there on my third beer, how do you think that's gonna go? There's wisdom, right? Do I have the freedom to do that? I do, I really do. But is it wise to be a stumbling block for somebody else? No, is that a hill worth dying on? Do I want somebody else to fall into sin and step away from Christ over just me enjoying something? No, it's not worth it. Again, does the Bible say that the offense, that the one easily offended is the weak Christian? Yes, read Romans 14. It calls him a weak Christian consistently. The one who's easily offended is weak. But the one who is strong should not set up a stumbling block for the one who is weak. Bear the burden. Would you rather drink some alcohol or have a huge tattoo across your back or whatever? Do you have the freedom to do it? Sure. But if it's going to cause somebody else to stumble, is it worth it? I would always unequivocally say, no, it's not. But we have to discern those things and decide, is this the stuff worth fighting over because, again, I've said this so many times. Unfortunately, I believe that I could typically say some really wrong things about Jesus Christ and there wouldn't be all that much complaint. But man, have a couple of songs get messed up or there's not greeters at the right doors or we started a little late or went a little long, I'll get a handful of emails at best. People get all riled up about that stuff. So what's, what's the point? Paul's saying, listen, I want you to focus on the things that really matter. And again, there are things that matter. Galatians 2, what does Paul do? He confronts Peter to his face. Hey, Peter, you're caught up in this circumcision thing, and you're making this about works. How dare you? Salvation's through faith in Christ, not about, not about circumcision. You're falling back into a works-based Salvation, and that's what happens. It's legalism. That's what legalism is, okay? Restrictions and convictions are good. They're not legalism. I think we've hijacked that word in Christianity. You personally think that you shouldn't do certain things, you should dress a certain way and all that, that's great. Have that conviction. It's not legalism. If you think that's the right way to worship the Lord, great. If you think that's earning you favor in the Lord or that it makes you right in his eyes, that's legalism. You're not saved by that. You are saved through Christ. And that was Paul's argument with Peter. Listen, you're making these people think that salvation comes through circumcision. It's through Christ, so he confronts him. Look what James says in James 3. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. 
Verse 4, continuing in that thought, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? So what James is saying and what Paul was saying in the other sections is, why are you guys infighting at the church? Because of your own pleasures. Essentially, your own preferences. James is like, you guys are fighting because some of you think things need to be a certain way and you're fighting over stuff that don't, that don't matter. But it's your preference and so you're, you're willing to die on that hill. And they're like, get off that hill. It's not worth dying on. There are hills worth dying on. I'll confront Peter to his face if he starts to change the message of the gospel. But if, if Peter says, you know, I'm gonna eat with food sacrificed to idols, okay, go ahead, man. It's not that big of a deal. It's not. You have freedom in Christ, but you have to be wise. So again, how can we get to a point of loving each other that way? How can we get to the point of God, I want to view people the way that you view them. I want to do whatever I can to put them in the center of your will. You have to love the Lord enough. You have to spend time in his word, and you have to love people enough and spend time with people to discern where they're at. Unfortunately, I think a lot of times we see each other or we see on Facebook like one message every month or we see each other and have a conversation once every like three months and we get in the car and we're like, boy, they're so messed up. Like, We haven't had enough time with them to even know what's going on. We've got to spend time with each other to help love each other this way, to abound in that kind of love. I mean, Paul's in prison and he's like, I so desperately want to be with you. I have such a deep affection for you. I want to be with you to teach you how to love the way that Christ loves others, to discern how to properly love each other, to recognize, do they need encouragement? Do they need admonishment? Do they need help? Should I be patient with them? Do I need to call them out? Do I need to go to their house? Do I need to bring them to me? Like all of those things are these constant discerning decisions that you can only make properly through God. And man, do I pray that for myself and for you all. And what does he say? Why? So that you would be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Again, we talked about that last week. What does that mean? On judgment day. He's saying, I want all of this for you so that when you stand before Christ, you hear, well done, good and faithful slave. That's what he wants. That's what he desires for people. And that is what I desire so deeply for y'all. That's what I desire deeply for myself and my wife and my children is that I would love properly and help push people towards that moment of hearing those amazing words. Well done. Well done. Finally, why all of this? Why all of this? There's even a grander picture. Verse 11, we're closing with this. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So he's saying, look, I love you guys because you're partakers of grace like me. We're the same family. Jesus Christ died for us, and we are family. That's what he's saying in verse 7. Verse 8, he's saying, and I want to love you the way that Christ loves you. Not only that, but I want y'all to abound. He didn't say y'all. He wasn't Southern. But, you know, he said, I want you to abound even more and more in that love. Why do I write you these things? Why do I care so deeply that these Judaizers are trying to teach you something different than the gospel I taught you? That's why he's writing this. Why do I care so much? Because if you know the Lord, if you know his word, then you'll be able to discern how to love him properly and how to love others properly. And you should do that so that as you interact, you can focus people towards the most significant things in life, Jesus Christ, and keep them from being distracted by the lowly things that we think are important but aren't. In order that, finally, the most important thing, in order that you bring praise and glory to God through Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, who gets the credit for any of this? If you're loving people properly and they're like, man, you're doing such a great job, Thank you. That's the Lord. That's through Christ. It's only through his grace that I'm able to do any of this because my natural way of treating people is awful. But through Christ, I have learned to love people and draw them closer to him for the praise and glory of God the Father. 
And so here's my prayer for you all this week. That you dive into God's word and you truly pray to the king of kings that he would help you understand his word, understand people, how to love them the way that he calls us to love them. Not the way we think we should do things, but the way that he calls us to do them. And give us the discernment in those moments in how to apply it properly. I'm telling you, if you do this, I've been doing this. I mean, I try to do it, and this is like not brand new, but this week especially trying to emphasize this, I'll tell you it's been one of the most challenging weeks because I start to really recognize how poor I do this as a husband, as a pastor, as a dad, and I'm trying to do better. I pray that you would pray for that for me, and I pray that for you all. Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the practicality of these words of what Paul has written here, Lord. God, you are the king of the universe. You can control hearts. You do control hearts. Lord, I pray for each one in this room that we would abound more and more in love that we would know your word, know what you desire of us and have the discernment in how to live that way and how to help lead others in that direction so that we may stand before your son and hear, well done, good and faithful slave. And Lord, I pray that all of this would be for your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we respond, let's stand if you're able and declare more of his glory.
So quickly, I feel like it's right. I try to be as transparent as I can to have a moment of confession and apology. You know, I'm still a growing pastor and Christian. In fact, I've been a lead pastor for however long I've been here. <laughs> so I'm still learning. I just, I know when I read these things, I don't love people this way all the time whatsoever. And I know I've failed people in this way. I know the Bible says that knowledge can puff up and make you proud and arrogant, and I can come down on people through that uh, lens sometimes. And the Bible says love rejoices in truth. And so if I walk away sharing truth and I'm not rejoicing in what I said, then I probably said something out of my own frustrations or my own wisdom or lack thereof instead of through the Bible. And so again, I just want to be as open as I can that I'm sorry if there's people here I've hurt with my own way of doing things and not loving properly. I know I have to apologize to my kids and wife more often than I'd like to admit, but I have relationships with people here, and uh, that's my role and goal, is to love the way that Jesus Christ does, to have an affection the way that he does for you all, and to work towards you hearing, well done, good and faithful slave. That's, that's what I try, and I know I fail at that, but I'm sorry for that, and I'm praying towards that goal, and I'm praying that for you all as well. So as we close, I want you all to just bow your heads. I'm going to pray as Paul prayed. I'm just going to read the scripture and pray it over you. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You are dismissed.